This is a draft of a presentation by Mary Lou Meyer uh, to the Second International Conference on Design Creativity. And Mary Lou and I are interested in how AIs can participate in larger, typically human collectives, but it could include other artificial intelligences as well. And we want the AIs to participate fully, fulfilling roles that perhaps the AI is best suited to fulfill in the context of a creative uh, collective. Um, this might be, the AI might be the uh, person who's not uh, afraid of being wrong and speaking up, although we'd like to soften the delivery somewhat. To participate fully, the AI uh, should be able to evaluate um, creative designs. And so this talk is about how we might start to endow an AI with the ability to evaluate creative designs, or perhaps in the longer term, uh, creative artifacts uh, in any domain. So we'll be introducing something uh, akin to the Turing test. We're going to be interested in looking at the results of uh, the creative process uh, and asking whether the result is indicative of um, creativity in the process. We want a test or an evaluation uh, methodology which is uh, can be applied independent of source. Uh, it could be the result of human creativity, creative computers, human computer partnerships, larger collaborations or collective intelligences. With a longer term of building in or enabling uh, computers of the future to um, act creatively themselves and to evaluate uh, their own creative output as well as the creative output of uh, others. Many are biased to uh, developing metrics uh, for evaluating creativity. They believe creativity is subjective and emotional. And we don't disagree with that. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that a computer can't be uh, endowed with the ability to uh, assess creativity, even if it's uh, initially quite limited in its assessment. Um, there are differing expectations depending on the uh, various fields, on what creativity is and who is creative. And we see, to some extent, uh, some of this work is enabling us to reach across or unify or synthesize uh, these various definitions and views on creativity. Uh, if we could develop a kind of Turing test for evaluating creativity, looking at artifacts rather than directly at uh, process, it might facilitate uh, transfer of research results across uh, creativity um, work in a variety of fields. We can eventually use it to endow computers uh, either operating autonomously or more typically probably as collaborators within a creative enterprise um, to do something uh, within that collaboration. If they can come up with their own assessments, make interesting suggestions as to um, what might be a, a good direction to follow. If you have an agent-centered uh, perspective, um, then you can view our work as focused on the observer uh, of the uh, creative process, where they can't directly observe the process itself, but a creation. We're not focused on the creator, but of course, at some point, observers do become creators, and they become collaborators in uh, creation. And so, in the longer term, uh, we expect some of our work to also uh, be applicable to computer creators of um, uh, artifacts. The important computational assumption, of course, is that uh, artifacts have to be formally representable for us to be able to um, assess them by computer, assess them for creativity by computer. There are many different kinds of formal representation schemes. We're going to be using feature vectors, although relational representations could be um, uh, in very important in other contexts and in the future. Just to review some previous creativity research, um, many of you um, creativity is operating within conceptual spaces and have talked about operations within conceptual spaces. Um, again, we're concerned with evaluating uh, creativity independent of the source. Um, but we believe that uh, these same conceptual operations are equally present in observers. They're looking at uh, creative output and they're going through uh, conceptual operations such as combination and synthesis, um, exploring and retrieval of things they've uh, experienced in the past or are imagining uh, as variants to what it is they're observing. Typically, creativity research is, on evaluation is looked at evaluating a person. 
this is interesting, but we're going to be looking at artifacts. And um, in the longer term, we're interested in how the evaluation of facts from the same creators uh, could be used to uh, assign authority or reputation to those creators. But for the moment, uh, we're focused on assessments of individual products. Certainly, a uh, uh, a large number of uh, researchers have thought about novelty and value or utility of the artifact as important in assessing whether it's uh, creative or not. And a few, much less, have uh, looked at the notion of surprise, that uh, somehow the artifact violates our expectations about um, um, what would be coming next within a, uh, a temporal trajectory of, um, of products. And so we're going to be adding surprise and considering how to formalize surprise, which nobody that we know of has done before. We'll be using in this talk uh, the Bloom laptop as an example of creative design. The Bloom was notable for its removable keyboard and uh, some other things. It was designed with the intent of recycling and making it easy to recycle by uh, easy disassembling. Um, this is kind of a classic example of bringing a new goal into a uh, design space and having it uh, be the initiator or trigger for uh, creative output. Again, we'll be using feature vector representations. Um, we got these vectoral representations of 6Max and the Bloom from um, the Max came from Apple.com, uh, the Bloom from the uh, uh, Bloom design team document, representations uh, along uh, some typical dimensions for uh, laptops, processor speed, um, memory, uh, battery life, and features that uh, were constant across uh, previous laptops, but uh, became salient when Bloom defined a laptop which varied radically along that dimension. We're thinking of body parts in particular, 14 for the Bloom and, and one for others. Again, the observer's conceptual operators are important to us, and there is a history of, uh, particularly within machine learning and artificial intelligence, of using clustering as a means of organizing an agent's memory. Uh, here we'll simply use k-means clustering, and the intent is that uh, k-means clustering or concept formation more generally be used to organize these observations, these laptops, and from these organizations we'll be assessing uh, uh, novelty and value and, and surprise. Uh, we use a distance measure, which is simply Euclidean distance, uh, sum of squared differences between each feature's value and, in our case, the centroid of the cluster's feature mean. Uh, in assessing novelty, we're looking at um, the description attributes or features that we just uh, talked about. When we clustered these uh, six max in bloom with k-means, we're assuming that the audience knows k-means clustering um, into two clusters. Um, the Bloom was placed with several uh, other laptops, but uh, was very far from the centroid of its own cluster. And this notion of distance from centroid, or centroids of all clusters, within a conceptual organization is, is how we would advocate uh, formalizing, at least initially, this notion of novelty as distance from previous representations. Again, the Features that distinguish the Bloom from uh, the other laptops, the number of body parts, and the fact that it has a removable trackpad. you notice that these were constant across earlier laptops, and they weren't salient operations for that reason, for purposes of distinguishing laptops until Bloom came along. You'll note at the bottom the large distance from its own centroid. We assess value or utility in a separate but possibly overlapping performance space. Uh, these are also features of the laptop, but they have to do with performance. And as we note in the paper, uh, performance to some may be described to others and vice versa. Many, for example, who use laptops simply for email may not regard um, processor speed as particularly important uh, in performance. Very gamers might uh, regard this uh, very important. So it's going to just, it's opinions amongst the gatekeepers of the observers will will certainly vary. So value in performance space, again, at least one of the components in assessing value would be distance from centroid. In this case, uh, Bloom was placed in its own cluster when we clustered uh, into clusters using k-means. Um, uh, naturally, if it's just in its own cluster, its uh, distance from its uh, centroid is zero. And so here we're assuming that uh, we're measuring distance to the opposing uh, cluster centroid. 
again, we're just proposing uh, distance and clustering as um, possible directions for uh, formalizing or operationalizing these notions of uh, value and novelty. Um, if we were to actually encode a computer, we would have to make a choice um, as to the exact function that we might use to evaluate um, uh, novelty and, and value. Uh, so rather than distance to its own centroid or distance to opposing centroids, um, it could be some of distances uh, to all the centroids, for example. Uh, this is not something we're terribly worried about at this point. We're just uh, doing sanity checks to see if distance and clustering uh, do lead to good operating criteria for uh, assessing um, uh, value and novelty. Notice that novelty also include, should include a directionality component. It's not simply that it's far from the centroids, but at least along some of the dimensions, it's, um, it has some positive value versus negative value. And so there is this directionality component that uh, we aren't talking about here, but to be included as well. Finally, initially we're interpreting surprise as a difference or distance so great that uh, in a new design that it would be effectively placed in its own cluster. It's uh, radically different than um, things that have been seen before. We characterize this as similar but different. In this case, it's quite different. Um, and in fact, when we uh, cluster the Bloom and the Max uh, using k equals 3 into 3 clusters, it is in fact uh, uniform, uniformly uh, placed alone. Even in value space, uh, in the two-cluster solution, the, the, the Bloom is placed alone as well. We think we have quite a ways to go in terms of evaluating uh, surprise. Again, we view surprise as uh, having a temporal component, that surprise is violating expectations. And those expectations um, are themselves virtual designs, uh, virtual space. And so we think we can adapt the same kinds of distance measures not to real previous designs, but to imagined designs of the future, um, which have nonetheless the same form. And so surprise can be regarded as uh, a function of distance to these imagined designs uh, that were imagined based on um, um, earlier thought trajectories. I uh, won't go too much into this diagram. It simply uh, talks about surprise as a change in trajectory between what actually arrives and what was imagined to arrive previously. So we've introduced a Turing test uh, for assessing creativity across uh, domains, so long as they can be represented in a formal way. We want to be able to do this independent or regardless of source, so that uh, be the uh, creator a human, an artificial agent, or a hybrid collective of humans and, um, and or agents. We have a means for assessing creativity that's free of the biases and uh, preconceptions uh, about that creator. For the moment, we've been focused on the conceptual processes of the observer rather than the creator. But of course, observers do creators. And we would hope that our AIs uh, use their evaluation capabilities to um, create themselves and to certainly collaborate in creative enterprises. We've been focused uh, on static spaces rather than temporally changing spaces. Uh, and k-means clustering also is a way of clustering en masse. Uh, certainly we want um, uh, to be able to look at the uh, time dimension, to look to see how novelty and value and particular surprise uh, vary with time, and both with previous designs and imagined designs of the future. We would want to use incremental clustering algorithms as models for concept formation in order to uh, model um, the uh, conceptual processes of uh, creators and observers. And um, there are certainly more expressive representations that we could use for artifacts, uh, relational first-order representations, for example, rather than uh, simply feature vectors.